Now, before I actually dive into what I would call my more formal presentation, um, I would like to thank you know Mark and his team for inviting me to speak with your group. I do know that everybody is probably in a slightly different place in terms of their knowledge and experience in using technology as a form of support. So in order to really bring us into alignment, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the basics. All righty. So to get started, um, in your roles, you maybe have heard the terms person first, employment first, technology first, and how in the world can everything be a first, right? And I think that's pretty confusing, so I'd like to offer a little bit of clarity here. So as most of you probably already know, you know, a person first approach means that people are at the heart of services. And so people direct their services. Um, they're involved in the selection of the services that they receive. Now, a technology first approach to services is really dependent on a person first approach being firmly established um, within an organization's culture. And I want to say that just one more time because I think it's so incredibly important. You really can't be a technology first organization or a company unless you have a person first foundation in place. So technology first does not refer to putting technology before the person, but excuse me, it does refer to the idea of considering technology solutions rather than automatically defaulting to a more traditional in-person, just-in-case service model. Okay, so all of that being said, there are some key tenets to a technology-first approach to services. I'm going to be reviewing four of those today. The first important one is that your technology solutions really are intended to help people improve their quality of life to gain or to main independ maintain independence and to help achieve their goals. So with that being clearly established, the implementation of technology solutions like remote support often does result in reduced costs and staff efficiencies. The second thing that's important that you uh, should know is that each and every person supported should be considered as a candidate for enabling technology. And that is re regardless of any disability or skill level. There seems to be this myth that technology is really only for people who have more, for lack of a better word, mild disabilities, I guess is how that's framed a lot of times. I think that's perpet perpetuated by this abundance of you know, stories and videos that you see that describe people moving from like a group home living situation into their own homes and apartments. And I definitely, these are wonderful achievements um, and they, they should most certainly be celebrated, but they don't necessarily represent the possibilities that technology presents to people who have um, more significant disabilities. So in reality, nearly anyone can benefit from using some type of technology. And so as an example, the ability to be able to control uh, lights in your home is really kind of taken for granted unless you don't have that ability, right? So these types of small acts of independence can really be a big deal for people. So it's in, really important for us to consider how and not whether technology can benefit everybody that we support. It's not about the technology at all. It's about how the technology can create more independence and support the person in attaining their outcomes. Now, the third kind of key tenet that I'd like to talk about is that it's really important for you to understand that a technology first approach to services does not equate to eliminating in person support. It does involve the reallocation of staff support. And this not, may sound like I'm missing words. I'm not, I promise. But what the technology does is it allows people to benefit from modern technology 
while still receiving the in-person supports that they need. So ideally what happens is staff members are directed away for, from doing for people and, and toward really enabling people to take ownership of the things that they can do with the support of technology. And so as that dependence is reduced on staff, staff are able to take over other types of responsibilities that require in-person support. So once again, I just Thank want you, to honey. you're welcome. Just once again, I really would like to clarify that uh, technology first approach to services does not eliminate in staff, you know, in-person support. It does not eliminate relationships. It does not eliminate those types of responsibilities that absolutely must be provided by another human being. So the fourth tenant that I'd like to talk about is kind of this idea that the balance of in-person support and technology is different for every single person. And that's because it really depends upon the unique needs and circumstances of every person, right? Uh, so as an example here, you know, the support needs of maybe an older adult who's been living independently for years, but maybe has experienced um, recent issues with memory or mobility, um, will be much different than the support needs of somebody who, maybe a young person who's living with CP, who's moving into their own apartment for the very first time. So in both cases, technology solutions might be very appropriate, but the implementation process would look very different for each person. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna tackle <clears throat> is kind of this whole myriad of terms referring to technology that's used to support people. Assistive technology, adaptive equipment, durable medical equipment, enabling technology. Um, a lot of times we get questions about, does this mean the same thing? The short answer is no, but as it is common in our world, um, things are a little bit more complicated than that. The definitions are different, even though they are frequently used interchangeably. And one of the reasons for this is that, one of the reasons that these waters are so muddy, I guess I should say, is that because individual states, particularly in their waiver language, utilize the terms differently. Uh, I do want to mention that at SHIFT, our focus is actually on enabling technologies. And that's the definition that you see up here on your screen now. Enabling technologies really refer to products, services, and devices that promote independence and encourage self-determination. So at this point in time, just for clarification purposes, I'd like to, to provide some examples of enabling technology to help you understand um, how they could actually be used to promote independence and encourage self-determination. So one of the most popular uh, in, the, in the arena right now is medication dispensers. And so medication dispensers are basically little devices that automatically dispense doses of pills at scheduled times. And there's a variety of these that are commercially available. They all have different features and price tags, you know, all of those bells and whistles. Um, you know, some have the ability to send text messages to uh, a support person when a person hasn't taken their pills within a certain time frame. Others have, uh, you know, accessibility features that are built in for people who have maybe some physical impairments. Uh, you know, some of these devices have the ability to hold up to 30 days of pills, while others have a very limited capacity. So, you know, regardless of all of those different features um, in the prices, you know, all of them really are intended to help people take medications that they need safely. So that is an example, uh, one example of an enabling technology. Now, another example is uh, those video doorbells. And some of you maybe already have these installed in your homes. Traditionally, video doorbells involve some, a camera and two-way audio that can be triggered by motion or by touch. 
um, they're really great devices in that they allow people um, to see and interact with people before deciding whether or not to open the door to their home. Um, and so they also can serve as a safety and security measure and alerting people to um, alerting people to and recording, I guess I should say, unusual activities outside of the home. Uh, another example of a good enabling technology are these smart speakers. And you oftentimes hear these referred to as virtual assistants. And a lot of times we see these smart speakers. And so I'm talking about like the Google Home or the Amazon Alexa. You see them paired with other devices like smart plugs or smart bulbs, thermostats, those types of things that allow people to control features um, with just voice commands or through automated routines. Uh, you know, smart speakers are capable of much, much more. But what I mean by this is, so let's say that you have a smart speaker in your environment and I can say, I'll say, um, Amazon instead of the other works. I don't want the devices in my environment talking, but Amazon, um, I'm going to bed, say, for example. And upon executing this command, it's a, a routine has been enabled that maybe shuts off all of the lights in your home and turns down the thermostat or uh, a variety of other types of things that you can pair to it. Um, so the Amazon devices are really great in that way because it allows people to voice control or utilize touch control on a tablet or a smartphone to automate and control their environment. So hopefully that tells you why I see the smart speakers as being one of those really cool enabling technologies that there's just a lot of possibilities for. Um, I also want to mention wearables. You know, wearables really do refer to these smart devices that you wear either on your body or integrated into your clothing. Their primary function is really to track some sort of a specific activity, um, but they can also serve, oftentimes they can serve as a phone or provide access to the internet too. And so I think one of the coolest examples of how I've seen a wearable work is I was, um, working with a gal who had an Apple smartwatch and we were, uh, she had some gait and mobility difficulties and we were walking along in a group and just ha having a conversation with her and she took a misstep off of a curb and fell. Well, she had her device, her wearable device set up in such a way that when the watch detected a fall, it started calling people on a call list. And so within a matter of seconds, we, you know, it had called her son and it had called, um, you know, another support person to say, um, hey, you know, you know, this person fell, um, you know, get in touch with her. And within seconds, they were on the phone with her, talking with her and making sure that she was okay. And so that was really cool to see that actually in in um, in action, I guess I should say. So there are a ton of things that wearables can do. That's just one example with that fall detection that I think is pretty cool. Um, finally, as kind of my last example of an enabling technology, I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about remote supports. And so the thing is, is I could talk about this topic for hours. So I'm going to try really hard just to keep this super brief for you. Um, the simplest way to describe remote supports is basically it's a service model that allows people to be supported by staff who work from a distance. And so over the past several years, remote support has really evolved, um, both as a service model and in terminology. So terms like remote support and remote supervision are really no longer in favor because they indicate kind of um, a type of restrictive oversight, kind of that big brother feel, right? And so now the term remote support has really come into being and that really, um, the term implies that a person is supported to be as independent as possible kind of using a combination of technology and in-person assistance. So remote support is never just exclusively um, 
being supported by staff at a distance. There's always going to be some type of a component of in-person support or in-person response. Uh, because again, technology can only go so far in supporting people. We always have to have a backup plan in place. We always have to ensure that we are providing for those opportunities and those <clears throat> times when in-person support is really needed. Technology just can't meet every single need. So now hopefully uh, you are familiar with a few types of technology. Um, now I kind of want to dive into talking about some of the common challenges of implementing enabling technology. And then be able to talk a little bit about some strategies for overcoming those barriers. But before I move on, I did want to just kind of hit pause here for a second to see if there were any questions from our audience about the material I've covered so far. I guess I have one. Um, the support system, how far does that go? I, I mean, I have a brother who's outside of Chicago. Um, I have a sister who's in Seattle. Um, would they be able to reach it should something happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that came from Sarah. I'm trying to look at my screen. Yes. Your top. Okay, great. <laughs> um, you know, it's a great question. And it's going to sound like I'm not going to, I'm going to answer, I'm going to do my best to answer it. So it depends a little bit on kind of what the support needs to look like. So let's say, do you have a specific type of technology that you have in mind when you're asking that question, Sarah? Um, we do have a um, Alexa Echo, I think. Oh, okay. All right. So depending on what that support actually needs to look like, your support system can be, you know, all over the country. It doesn't really matter, you know, all over the world for that matter. It doesn't really matter where your support network is. But that being said, it depends upon kind of the unique circumstances and needs of the person. So say, for example, let me go back to that example where I used um, where the person was wearing an Apple Watch and they had a fall. Okay, so, you know, I think it's fine that um, that actually happened in the Chicago area. I think it's okay that the phone, um, that the fall detection alerts somebody who lives in a different state um, because that allows the person then to check in and say, hey, mom, is everything going okay? Are you hurt? What's going on? But in that circumstance, if the person had been seriously injured, you're going to need some sort of a local response. So that needs to be built kind of into your backup plan. So again, it depends on what the support looks like. So if we're talking about remote supports, say for example, um, maybe it's very appropriate for somebody in Nebraska or Washington or Illinois to be able to kind of be serving as a guide or a prompter through certain activities, but you're always going to want to build in some sort of a contingency for what happens when an in-person response is needed. So I'm gonna give you another example and I'm hoping Sarah that this is going to illustrate better for you where I'm coming from. Let's say for example, that you would have a medication dispenser in place and you have it set up so that it alerts somebody if you haven't taken your medications within a certain time frame. I think it's fine that that alert goes to a sister or a brother or a mom or dad who doesn't live anywhere near you because they can, you know, pick up the phone or use an Amazon Echo to connect with you in some way to find out what's going on. But there may be, that may also be indicative of a time when you need an in-person response. Maybe you've had a fall and injured yourself and that's the reason you haven't taken your medication. So you always want to have that contingency plan, that backup plan in place that says we need a live human being responding in circumstances where remote, where people are not able to do that remotely. Does that help answer your question, Sarah? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Anna has her hand raised. Okay. Uh, 
by Constance. Um, so I had um a question about maybe more so the the remote supports also. Um, so with that would would that be maybe an example of like um a video monitor um being used and monitored um you know to detect like falls and and like seizures and things like that. I'm going to do my best to answer your question. And again, I said I can speak on this for hours. So I'm going to try to keep it brief and give you the biggest bang for your buck. Okay. So there's lots of different remote support systems that can be implemented. So one example would be, you know, you go down to Best Buy or order some stuff, stuff off of Amazon that includes different sensors and monitors. And you maybe have a little system that you have set up for one person that you support, and that works really well. So in a system like that, you maybe bring in some sensors and technology to install into a person's room or apartment. And then any types of alerts are being sent to, you know, maybe a family member's phone. And so they're aware of, you know, what's going on in the environment and they are able then to provide assistance as needed. Then there's kind of like more formal remote support systems that are basically hosted by like third party systems where there's a company who comes in and says, okay, we really are experts in these types of technologies and providing this support. So we're really going to kind of assess the person for what their needs are. We're going to make recommendations on technology. We're going to help you get it installed. And then we are actually going to monitor all of that for you remotely. That'll be our staff monitoring it, you know, monitoring it remotely. And then if there's in-person support that's actually needed, there's generally speaking someone in the home or in the organization that that third party can reach out to, to say, hey, um, you know, Joe, you know, maybe has this going on at home, he needs somebody actually to go over to his house and help him out in person. And then there's another type of remote support where um, the, usually it's a provider organization says, hey, we really wanna provide remote support ourselves. So they acquire all of the technology, the systems, the software, the monitors uh, in office space, and they become kind of the resident experts for assisting, for evaluating appropriateness for remote supports. They identify all the technologies, they put those into place, and then they actually uh, provide that support remotely within the context of the organization. The thought process behind that being that if the organization is providing the support themselves, then there's already good relationships developed between the supporters and the person supported. And so it's not quite such a stretch. You get you already have relationships and, and you already know one another. So those are kind of the three models of remote support that are most common. All of this being said, I promise, Jen, I'm headed to your answer, I think. Um, depending on what system you choose, that um, you know, will affect the flexibility you have in the technologies. But in general, most of these systems are going to include some sort of a monitor, whether that's behind a computer screen or on a tablet or whatever it might be. Uh, they're going to include or can include things like stove sensors, medication dispenser sensors. They're going to include um, potentially fall detection. Uh, they may or may not involve cameras. Um, if they do involve cameras, those are, to my knowledge, I don't think anyone in the country is allowing them in personal spaces. So it's really only in um, like living rooms and kitchens and dining rooms where those types of, of devices can be used. So you can actually integrate a lot of off-the-shelf technologies that you might go get at Amazon or Best Buy into even those third-party systems. It really just depends upon the remote support provider that you have. But all of that does become possible through remote support. So I know that was a long answer, Jenna. I'm hoping, did I get there? Like, is that the direction you wanted me to go with that? Oh. Yeah, that, that answer was very helpful, Constance. Thank you. You bet. No problem at all. We have one more question. Chris Root has it on the hand up. Yeah. I was wondering if 
you have, I was wondering if you, for some reason, don't want to get that particular person that was your support, that was your remote support. If you don't want them to be their, your support anymore, can you do that? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Uh, it depends a little bit on the type of remote support system that you choose. Obviously, if you kind of have a homegrown one where you run down to Best Buy and you get the equipment that you want, um, it's pretty easy to change the support person. Like, I don't want this person to support me anymore. I want this person to support me anymore. It did become maybe a little bit more complicated when you're using a third-party provider. That being said, most of the third-party providers that I've worked with, if you call them up and say, listen, I'm not comfortable with this person. I don't have a good relationship with them. I don't like them. I don't think they're supporting me in the ways that I want to be supported. Most of those third-party systems are going to listen to you and uh, reassign then support for remote supports. So I think that would be one of those questions that you would want to ask if you were going to go with a third-party remote support system like that. That would be one of the questions that you would want to ask during that interview process is to say, well, what happens if I get your system and I don't like the person that's supporting me? Like, how do you handle that? That would be a great interview question for a vendor. There's one more question. Linda uh, Typer wrote, I have a question, but I, I have <laughs> to type, type it. Okay, that's me. Are. That's me. Can you hear me? Because I was having trouble with my microphone. Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Here's here's the question. I hope to be fast. Um, my son, I I wanted to get him a watch, something wearable that he could then make a phone call to me or his dad. He he's he's not real high functioning autism, but he's got you know some capabilities, and I kind of have been wanting to put him out there a little bit more by himself because I'm 66 and his father is 70 and we got to start really getting him onto more independent things. So I found out from a friend that the Gizmo watch doesn't do very well in our area. I live in Buena Vista, Colorado. It's kind of, we just don't have enough re reception, I guess. So, <laughs> you know, the option would be, I, I have Android. The option maybe would be to get him an Apple Watch. Those are the best. Is that true? There's a few directions you could go. Um, and again, I I'm gonna mention a couple of things for you to think about, Linda. And I know I could we could I know you and I could spend an hour having a conversation about this. So I'm gonna Ooh. just try to give you point you in a few directions. Um so the, there's nothing really wrong with the gizmos, but they're really intended for children and they do have some issues with reception potentially. So I think you have to be thinking about like, if I go get my son an Android phone, what am I concerned about that he might be accessing or doing on that phone that is not appropriate? And maybe the answer to that is nothing. Maybe I'm just totally cool with him just carrying a phone um, maybe I'm okay with him carrying, you know, using an Apple smartwatch, smartwatch, which is basically, you know, a phone and a watch. Do you have any concerns about that? No, I really uh, don't. I okay. really don't. And um, my con here's my concern. He would lose it. Okay. If it was a watch, he wouldn't lose it. Okay. So a few things to be thinking about. Um, so I could see the direct, why you might want to go the direction of a watch, and I wouldn't discourage you from doing that. But there are a lot of different watches on the market out there. And so the Apple smartwatch has you know, gained a lot of popularity because it does have some really cool features. But Android also has a lot of watches that they make that are wearables too. I wouldn't discourage you from looking at those What's going to be important is what features are you looking for? And then also like, how are you going to integrate that with your existing plan? So if you're an Android user and you utilize, um, I don't know, AT&T or whatever, you, you know, whatever, you use Verizon or whatever, you Verizon. know, what options are you going to be able to integrate that smartwatch within your existing plan too? But be taking a look at the smartwatches themselves and the features that they have rather than necessarily relying on a single brand. It's going to expand your options a little bit. Um, the other thing is if you don't find a watch that you love that has great features that meet your needs, it's not a terrible idea to consider a phone. 
and then add some sort of a tracking mechanism to the phone. So if you're worried about your son losing that device, can you enable Find My iPhone or other tracking features then that allow you to hunt down the phone if it does get misplaced? So I know I, I feel like I just threw a bunch of information at you, but those perfect. are some of the things that no, I would be looking at. That's perfect. That's perfect. Cool. Cool. Good deal. We've got one more question from Laura. Is it safe to say that enabling tech does not require prescription while assistive tech is prescribed. Was that Laura that asked that question? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're going to open a can of worms. Um, so earlier I had mentioned that there's this whole, this myriad of, of terms that gets used. That is oftentimes tied to specific regulations and who can authorize or prescribe it or get it covered through insurance or get it covered through waivers. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So for example, oftentimes you see communication devices or, and I'm gonna start with communications. Oftentimes you see communication devices in order to have that covered by insurance, it needs the, um, it needs to be prescribed by like a speech language pathologist. Now, a lot of times your durable medical equipment, so wheelchairs, walkers, that type of thing um, is generally what that is described as, needs the kind of, um, needs to be prescribed by an, uh, an OT or a PT. Now, assistive technology and enabling technology um, states handle those a little bit differently. Those, first of all, those terms are, two terms are most commonly the ones that are used interchangeably. In a short answer, it depends on your state and it depends on your insurance. Some states have said, you know what, you have to be certified as a shift enabling technology integration specialist in order for us to cover this technology. This technology. Some states have said you need to be, you know, certified as this other thing in order to prescribe that. Some states have said you don't have to be certified as anything to prescribe it and have it covered as a waiver service. So the short answer to your question is, in general, communication devices and uh, durable medical equipment has to be prescribed by a speech language pathologist or an OTPT, but assistive and enabling technology to really depends upon your state and the waiver language in your state. That's the shortest answer I can come up with, Laura. That's it, thank you. Okay, thanks very much for monitoring those questions for me, it's super helpful. So welcome back everybody. Um, so I guess I wanna start off next by saying, okay, so if technology is so beneficial, why isn't everybody doing it? Why haven't organizations adopted this technology first approach to services? Um, you know, just to be really honest, there's there's a lot of challenges associated with adopting a technology first service model. Um, first and foremost, uh, we know that organizations who have moved away from viewing themselves as caretakers and toward viewing themselves as supporters are more likely to be successful with adopting a technology first approach to services. And again, that's because staff should be directed away from doing for people toward allowing people to do the things on their own that they can do on their own with technology. We also know that many direct supporters still view themselves as caretakers. Um, kind of serving to protect and to shelter their people. And yes, I have issues with all of that terminology I just used, but that should kind of tell you where we're coming from as far as that challenge goes. <clears throat> that attitude that we see so prevalent among our direct support staff, again, not being malicious in any way, shape or form, but that attitude really does require adjustment which happens through ongoing education and training. Now, as I mentioned earlier, each and every person supported should be considered as a candidate for technology. 
And that whole idea that technology is really only appropriate for people with mild disabilities, we've, we've already said is it's just a complete utter myth. Just remember that any, excuse me, just remember that in any enabling technology that's um, designed to promote independence and uh, encourage self-determination is, is a worthy goal. So, you know, for, again, for one person that might be in their own home, another person might be to eat their meals independently. In both cases, technology can facilitate those outcomes, but it's really important to consider technology as a potential outcome for every, everyone that you support. And the last thing that I mentioned here in relation to you know, the person-centered planning really being um, firmly established is there's an important concept. Many of you have probably heard it or familiar with it, but that's called dignity of risk. And that's really the right of any person to make choices and mis make mistakes. And we do view that as being an integral part of self-determination. And thus also an important idea relate related to person-directed planning. So I wanted to make sure that I get that in there and mention that as well. So those are some of the challenges that we see. Now, a nationwide study completed in 2021 cited limiting tra limited training opportunities as one of the biggest barriers. And I saw some of that pop up also on the chat when you guys were talking about some of the barriers that you face. Shift was really born from this need. We're the only company that offers technology first credentials, certifications, and accreditation that are specifically designed with the intellectual and developmental disabilities community in mind. So how in the world does SHIFT support providers through the process of adapting a technology for a service model? As Mark mentioned earlier, we're really an online education and accreditation platform that you know, we were solely developed to advance the technology first movement through standardized best practices. Now, as far as all of our coursework goes, um, all of our courses are online. People take them when they're convenient for them. Plus our content is really designed to appeal to people who have different learning styles. And so there's audio voiceovers and lots of, for all the written content, there's lots of videos and many interactive components to help kind of enhance that learning experience. Now, all of this being said, um, at Shift, we know that in order to be successful with this technology first approach to services, People at every single level of an organization really do need to be knowledgeable about and involved in this process. So we've designed that with our credentials and our certifications in mind. I'm gonna come full circle to a couple of questions that were asked earlier. So the first is the Enabling Technology Credential. I'll throw some acronyms at you. You don't have to remember these, the ETC. It's really most appropriate for people who require a foundational understanding of technology integration. Most generally, this is directed toward our direct supporters. Now, our enabling technology credential includes three courses, fundamentals one, two, and three, and also involves an exam. So we expect that this um, time, the time commitment needed to complete this would be about five hours. Now, shifts enabling technology credential is also credentialed through an ADSP, just kind of as a side note, so you know that. Now, we also have this Enabling Technology Integration Specialist, ETIS. I mentioned that one earlier because in some states, uh, the waiver language is mandating that a person be an ETIS in order to provide assessment, planning, recommendations, and therefore um, funding, uh, waiver funding for specific types of technologies. So uh, most often these professionals work with or for organizations to do those assessments to you know, ensure kind of a good match between the person and the technology, to be able to provide training, serving as a resource and a mentor for organizational staff. So the ETIS involves the same fundamentals one, two, and three coursework because we think it's important everybody has starts off with the same basic information, but then also includes specialist coursework. And um a component that we call our experiential learning project where the person is takes their 
book learning and applies it practically to a project. So we expect that an ETIS is going to take about 15 hours uh, to earn that. And then we have our Enabling Technology Navigator Certification or ETN. That's really most appropriate for people who serve in a kind of a case management role. So people who are developing and writing person-centered plans. So the ETN starts off with the same fundamentals one, two, and three. It has some specialization coursework in that experiential learning project as well. Um, and we expect that that takes about 15 hours to complete as well. And finally, our enabling technology leadership certification is really most appropriate for agency and organizational leaders, including the people who might be spearheading um, the technology first culture shift. So the ETL starts off with the same fundamentals when we turn three, it has specialist coursework, live instruction, and then a practical component as well. And we expect that that course takes about 15 hours to complete too. So some of the details about our coursework is all of our coursework is valid for two years from the date of enrollment. And so we do require that all of our credentials and certifications be completed within 90 days of enrollment. And the reason that we have that requirement in place is because it maximizes individual learning and it also helps the organization continue their forward progress of adopting the initiative. But like most professional certifications, there are continuing education requirements in place. So for the ETIS, the ETM, and the ETL, those require 10 hours every two years. But you don't have to go anywhere else to earn those hours. Shift offers uh, all of our continuing education hours internally um, at no extra cost for people. So you have the opportunity to earn all those hours internally. Now, all of this being said, I want to also tell you a little bit about our accreditation process. That's kind of our education process. Accreditation um, is, a, is a completely separate entity. Now, many organizations who go through education, so they have earned their credentials and their certifications, um, choose to pursue accreditation. And so this is a highly collaborative approach um, where organizations we help organizations bridge the gap between education and practical experience. So if you'll humor me for a second, um, you know, think a little bit about your previous school experiences. Um, you received information, tools, and resources, but in order to really develop your skills, you need practical experience. And for some of you, that may have come in the form of your first kind of career-oriented job. So credentials are similar through SHIFT. To get the most out of your education, you really need experience to develop and hone your skills. And so SHIFT partners with organizations during the accreditation process to serve as a resource and a guide and a mentor for the successful adoption of technology. So that tells you a little bit about SHIFT and kind of how we have tried to address the challenges of um, limited training opportunities. All right, now, the other thing that often happens is providers often face um, reluctant, we might even say sometimes hostile attitudes toward technology adoption. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but nearly all of them kind of stem from a lack of knowledge or inaccurate assumptions. Uh -huh. So while SHIFT believes in the importance of our curriculum, we recognize that not all staff are going to have the opportunity to earn our credentials and our certifications. That being said, it's really, really important that everyone receive at least a you know, basic information about enabling technology and technology first best practices. Providing that foundational information really does help to combat assumptions and the spread of misinformation. Um, thus, you know, hopefully resulting in, you know, kind of an increased buy-in and uh, helping get team members on board with using technology as a support. So a few ideas for you to think about um, to help um, increase excitement and um, increase buy-in. So one of the first things I would recommend is to incorporate an experiential component into that training process. Um, some people actually have availability of a 
space where people can go to use or see a variety of technologies. Um, now, not every state has this, um, but many do, whether it's an independent standalone entity, uh, like an enabling technology home or demonstration space, or if it's the opportunity to go through your state's AT program, uh, who also has demonstration capacity, be thinking about how you can integrate that into your training and your learning for the group of people who would be involved in this. The other thing that I would encourage you to use is to make sure that all of your team members understand what enabling technology is and is not. Um, you know, a lot of times people are really anxious about technology integration because they don't really know what it is or how it works. And so taking the time to educate on the basics and addressing common fears or misconceptions is really important. You know, just kind of as a side note, despite the fact that we see provider organizations with vacancy rates of usually somewhere between 40 and 60%, um, a lot of times when you bring forward the whole idea of technology integration, especially when we start talking about remote supports, Direct support staff get really nervous. They think that you're working them out of a job or you're trying to eliminate um, human contact for people that they're supporting. So it's really important that you have some education from the get-go as you start to talk to folks about this. Um, one of the other things that might be helpful is having your team members think about how they use technology in their own lives and then figuring out how some of those same products can apply to the people that they're supporting. Um, you know, smartphones, video doorbells, smart speakers, you know, those types of things. It might help your team members kind of open their minds to how people could utilize the same devices that they're using on a daily basis to promote independence. Uh, one of the things I would recommend is to start small. Um, so implementing one or two small pieces of technology in the beginning and adding on over time uh, has a lot of advantages. The first is it allows the team to get more comfortable with the technology. It allows the person supported to get more comfortable with the technology, but it also kind of helps build success. So if you start really small, like, okay, maybe I'm going to have an Amazon device paired with a smart plug so that somebody can turn on and off their lights independently with their voice. That's a really great small thing to do initially and help build success on. Okay, well, so that's working really well. Now, how can we expand this Amazon device so that the person can control other aspects of their environment? Or how can we look at expanding technology into other areas to help them be independent? Um, and I think one of the other things that's really important is helping your team understand that technology and in-person support, it's not like an either or scenario, it's a, a both and scenario. So enabling technology that I mentioned before will never replace some forms of direct support from family and from friends um, and from staff members. So before we move on, um, a couple of other important concepts for you to be thinking about is technology implementation definitely is not an all or nothing approach. So start again, start small, give the person an opportunity to increase their skill with and independence, build some success. Um, and that strategy can be really helpful for um, bringing reluctant staff members on board. And the second thing that I think is really important for you to understand is that the people you support don't necessarily need to like to understand or um, to be interested in technology itself. It's more important that um, for truly person-directed goals to think about technology as a means to an end. It's one tool in the toolbox that helps the person attain their goal or their outcome. Okay. So now I saw several comments in about this in the chat as well, and that's that funding can be tricky. So providers, depending on the state, can really struggle with identifying and securing funding options for enabling technology. 
And that can remain an issue even for states who have allowed for the inclusion of enabling technology into their waivers because of things like funding caps or limitations on the types of products, services, or devices. And then some states have also developed rather cumbersome processes for accessing funding. And those can all stand in the way, those can all serve as barriers, even in states where the waiver has allowed for enabling technology. But despite all those obstacles, the best place to start is with identifying your funding sources in their in your waivers. Um, if you're if you are not receiving a waiver service or that product, service, or device is not covered as part of the waiver service, there's a lot of other funding options that can be considered. And a few things that you could be thinking about is, um, does your state or other agencies uh, dedicated to supporting self-advocates often offer grants that can be used for the purchase of funding technologies? I know I've had a lot of good luck with um, partnering with councils on DV and ARC chapters uh, for grants for people supported. So make sure you familiarize yourself with kind of the parameters of those grants and those programs that might be available. Um, also be taking a look at foundations to see if uh, foundations in your area will support a technology initiative. Also don't rule out the person supported contributing toward the, the cost of their technology or family members and guardians contributing toward the cost of the technology. And the reason that I bring this up is, though not everyone is in this situation, sometimes the family or the person supported does have enough money to be able to purchase a specific type of technology if it's something they really want, and there's not another funding source for it. So, you know, for some of these technologies, especially the commercially available mainstream technologies, they have gotten very, very inexpensive. So <clears throat> if you hop on to say Amazon around Black Friday or that time of year, you know, you can pick up like an Amazon dot for you know 15 or 20 bucks. So and even at other times of the year, many of these mainstream technologies are very affordable. So before you think about technology as being something that's really expensive, and there are some very expensive, high-tech, complicated technologies out there, be taking a look at potentially mainstream technologies that can be very affordable to be paid for out of pocket. I also want to mention an interesting thing that we've seen um, over the last several years is that many providers have really chosen to purchase equipment without reimbursement. Um, for multiple reasons. First, because it supports the person's goals, but also then it does have the capacity to reduce expenses and allow for the reallocation of staff members. An example of what I mean by this is say an organization wants to be able to put remote support in at three different locations that they are responsible for. The organizations may say, you know what, that's going to be a $20,000 expense, a capital expense to us. We're going to go ahead and pay it. And the reason we're going to pay it is because it's going to promote the attainment of outcomes, the attainment of goals for the people that are living in those locations. But guess what? Because of the way that we're being able to reallocate staff members, we might actually as an organization be saving $40,000 a year. So some organizations have the capacity to say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and fund this one-time capital expense, knowing that that's going to pay off significantly in the future. So I did want to mention that that is a dynamic that we're seeing more of um, in recent years as well. Okay. Now, this one might seem fairly obvious to you, but I'm going to bring it up. It takes a ton of work to successfully adopt a technology-first approach to services. So developing new policies, procedures, systems, and processes really does take a lot of time, resource, and expertise. And we know that all of those are short supply. So even in organizations who can commit to hiring dedicated personnel don't find themselves on an easy road. So few people possess, you know, possess expertise in this area meaning that organizations then either have to compete for those limited resources or they have to develop knowledge and skill within their own resource pool. 
And that's the reason that a lot of organizations do partner with Shift because we essentially help serve as kind of a resource and a guide through the adoption and implementation of a technology first approach to services. We essentially can kind of take over the training of your existing personnel. So a couple of things to be thinking about here. Um, first of all, one of the first decisions an organization is going to make when thinking about a technology first approach to services is whether or not they want to use existing staff who will hold other positions within the organization to support their technology initiative. There's pros and cons to both strategies. Um, first, think about this. While using existing staff to spearhead this initiative might seem really cost effective, it can oftentimes result in staff members being overwhelmed and then failing to meet expectations. There's kind of a con to that. Now, existing staff members will likely require additional training as they assume new responsibilities. Whereas if an organization adds resources, the required skill set can be actually integrated into the hiring process. Also be thinking about you know, the fact that existing staff members are familiar with an organization's policies, procedures, systems, and processes. And so a new staff member who's hired from outside the agency would need to learn all of that. And so that could result in a delay with forward progress with the initiative because an external person doesn't have all of that information at their disposal. The other um, pro of considering existing staff is that Existing staff member have, members have already cultivated a relationship within the organization with other staff members and with people supported. So a lot of times that means that that person will have an easier time identifying really great candidates for technology and for getting buy-in from other staff members than would a person hired from outside the organization. Um, one strategy that does work really well for many agencies is to hire one or more existing staff members to exclusively support the technology initiative. So that approach has a lot of benefits. It allows the organization to capitalize on the staff members' existing knowledge of the agency. Um, and it also allows the staff member to kind of tap into established relationships within the agency, thus increasing buy-in, hopefully, and more rapidly. Um, and third, the organization is investing into a known employee. So it's really nice when you can identify and promote a person from within the organization. That's a very known factor, whereas if you hire someone externally, you're, you're taking a little bit of a gamble. You are basing judgment on you know, resume and re references, but you don't really know the person that you're getting until they get on board and you're working with them. Um, and then again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, in choosing a staff member internally, it allows people to make a new skill set and gives them an opportunity for career advancement too.